front of my desk and did one of these, and I just I thought, oh, you know, really, is that is, is is this is this what's happened? So from there, did things get better for women? Uh, I don't know. No, you know, not on the sell side. I don't know if you saw Wolf of Wall Street, Leonardo DiCaprio. I mean, that was really that. That's really the way that it, it, they acted. And drugs, alcohol, prostitutes. I mean, it 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 went on. Uh, fortunately, I spent my time in Houston and then in Dallas when I opened my own trading desk, and so. I didn't have to, I wasn't in the mire of that, but when I visit my compatriots in New York, a lot of this, you know, I would be exposed to a lot of this. Uh, again, I was, I was very fortunate that I didn't take any personally, nor did I have to join in, so we had that going on. All right, so enough of that. Um, basically today I'm going to talk about REITs, Real Estate Investment Trusts. And real estate investment trusts are uh, uh, vehicles that um, uh, they own and operate income producing real estate. They're publicly traded stocks. They pay less in corporate taxes and cap gains, and they're required to pay out 90% of their income in the form of dividends to shareholders. Um, they have to have 75% of their assets in real estate. And now we have 31 REITs in the S&P 500, which is very, that's very distinctive. When I started in the industry, in, 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 the, in the REIT era, I guess it was 1980 is when I started focusing on REITs. There were four REITs, market cap was um, $5 billion. And when I left the industry in uh, 2014, uh, the market cap was a trillion. And there were, I, I don't even know, hundreds of REITs. There were hundreds of publicly traded REITs. So it, it really went, went a long way. And what brought this to be able to make so many REITs and to have it happen were the lower interest rates. It was called positive spread investing. So as interest rates went lower, if you could buy, buy property for a three cap and generate a six cap in yield, uh, then, then that's, that was good. All right. So I am going to um, talk right now about the REITs, but before I get started, I'll give you a little, little question. I am going to talk about the different sectors, um, the office REITs. They manage, obviously, they manage all the office real estates, the industrial. They own and manage industrial facilities. You see them at Hobby Airport. Uh, uh, the Intercontinental the Ship Channel, you know, all those warehouses, that's your e-commerce, comes off the plane, they're stored there, your Amazon truck picks them up, and off they go. So that's called industrial storage. Then there's a retail REITs, there's two, two kinds. There's um, uh, the mall REITs, which are the enclosed, and then there's the strip center REITs, like you'd see in Westview, you know, all of those open REITs, and, and the Galleria would be called a, a, a mall REIT. There's lodging, which is obviously hotels. They uh, own resorts, uh, usually managed by a lot of third-party brand. Residential REITs, which are apartments like Camden. Self-storage REITs, Cube uh, is, is a big one here. And the data center REITs, which own and manage data storage facilities, you know, because the, um, they lease spaces to technology companies to house servers and, and other kind of equipment. So. Again, I mentioned office, I mentioned industrial, retail, mall and strip, lodging, residential, self-storage REITs, and data center REITs. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. What sector from the pandemic, in the beginning, let's call it November of 2019 until February 2022, what sector do you think has had the best total return? Again, office, industrial, retail, lodging, residential, self-storage, and data center. Which ones do you think have, has performed the best during this entire time? Industry. Sorry. Pardon? Industry. Industrial. Okay. Industrial. All right. Anyone else? Sir? I would think residential. Residential. Ma'am? Residential. Residential. Yeah, the same. 
residential. Okay, nobody got it. Self storage REITs up 70.4% from that period. And here's why. Um, three reasons. Kids didn't go back to college. Where do you store that furniture and all that crap you're going to take? You, you, buy, so you buy a storage box and you put your stuff in a storage box. Restaurants, they had to close up during a different time or maybe they had to have what they called uh, space in between. So they took their excess furniture and put it in these, in, in these storage sheds. The, the third thing is the what we'll be talking about a lot today. It's called the WFH phenomenon. I'm sure you've seen it in the press. Work from home, WFH. H, and that's a phenomenon that is sweeping through our country. So you have a second bedroom, but you don't really need all that guest furniture because nobody's going to visit you during COVID. So you take all that guest furniture and you buy yourself a nice uh, office, maybe put a, a Peloton in there hoping you don't kill, get killed on it. And uh, that is, so you take all your bedroom furniture and put it in self-storage in. So that is the basic reason why self-storage is just done exceedingly well. Now, so you were next, which wouldn't have been bad if you bought industrial, it was up 57.3% during that period. That's not a bad return either. Um, data center up 43.8. Data centers have always had a, a high return, so they didn't really go up that much more, uh, but you know, they, they kind of, they stayed the same. Residential, you were close. 25.5% they were up during that period, uh, which in fact uh, is not a shabby return either. Then you have uh, all equity REITs, if you put them all together, were up 21%. So if you just bought the Vanguard VNQ, uh, you would have been up 21% during that period. Retail was up 9.9%. Um, office was down 8%. And lodging and resorts was down 8.8%. So um, that's, uh, that's basically the little scorecard of, of what happened. Now, um, I am, yeah, okay, this is what happens when you make too many copies and your notes are not in front of you on your copy. All right. So now what I'd like to speak about is the outlook for the economy in terms of the commercial um, real estate REITs, commercial, you know, which are all the REITs. And as I said in the beginning, a REIT is a publicly held company and its underlying asset are real estate. So um, I think at 2022, we will likely to see significant further improvement in overall economic conditions. We have rising GDP, job growth, higher incomes. Um, it seems that inflation pressures might gradually subside and long-term interest rates will remain well below their, their historical norms. Um, you know, I just, because I'm an old person, I just have to laugh at what we're calling high interest rates now. I mean, <laughs> just to put it into perspective, in um, 1964, my parents bought a house, 30-year mortgage, 5.8% 30-year mortgage. Right now, a 30-year mortgage is between 3.9 and 4.25. I mean, even if it goes up to 5.5%, 6%, you're buying uh, real estate at 2022 inflated prices at 1964 interest rates. I mean, when you think of it, that's pretty damn incredible when you, when you think about it. So for me, I, you know, again, I just have to say that that seems pretty pretty cheap to me. But then again, I'm not sitting on the Fed, Fed board and, and where people are complaining why we're going from 1.2% on the 10 year to a 2.1%. You know, I mean, it seems pretty academic to me. However, um, secondly, um, it, this is this was during, in 1981, my husband and I bought a house in Houston. 
our mortgage is 21%. 21% in 1981. And we were so excited because our neighbors closed two days later and theirs was 23%. So what happened in that era, um, which in 1987 we had a huge crash, the largest crash ever on Wall Street, but what happened is when you had that huge of an interest rate, you could never really establish equity in your home because most of your house payments every month were your interest payments. So you weren't really paying principal down. So 10 years later, when you wanted to refinance, when interest rates were 10 or 12%, you couldn't unless you came to the table with money to bring your equity up because you had to have equity. You know, you have to have equity in your home to be able to refinance and you couldn't refinance. I mean, and that was, those were the years where people just walked away from their homes. I mean, literally in the late 80s, people just walked away from their homes, particularly a lot of people in Houston because they couldn't refinance, they couldn't afford these side payment rate, they couldn't, then you can't sell your house. I mean, you don't have any equity in your house and, and you know, your equity's at 200,000 and your home's worth 180, who's going to buy it going to the, you know, the table. So that was that was a big way. And you know, the interesting thing about that time period that I found out later on, they never kept statistics on that because mortgage companies and the finance companies weren't computer literate and they did they couldn't update. So you virtually could walk away from a home in 1984 and then get a mortgage in 1986 and they didn't have records of your walk away. So it was, it was a very interesting time in that industry. Um, so inflation between 1975 and 1980 was 12.5 to 13%. From 1990 to 2020, 2.5%, 3%. So if we go up to maybe, what, 35 percent 5%, 5%, I don't think that's a reason for us to be in panic mode. But then again, I'm not getting arrows thrown at me because I'm sitting on uh, the board of the Federal Reserve. Although Jerome Powell might let me to mention these little comments given history back. So um, I think it's interesting because um, I don't think that the markets or the rest of the economy are going to go back completely to the way they were before the pandemic. The pandemic changed the way we live our lives, do our shopping, and conduct our businesses. Some changes may dissipate over time, while others are likely to be permanent. Nearly every sector of commercial real estate will be impacted one way or another. As we assess the outlook for REITs in 2022 and beyond, it's helpful to distinguish between the cyclical effects and the longer-term structural changes that results in change, changes in behavior. Um, the REIT performance to date during the pandemic and the outlook for economic activity and overall macroeconomic conditions, then we'll consider how the pandemic has made deeper changes on how we live our lives and how this affects how we use commercial real estate. I mean, some things, I think some things were headed the way they, they're happening now, but I don't think we would have, we, I don't think we would have arrived at the WFH phenomenon so quickly. An example is in a job posting app or uh, website, 20, uh, they, the high paying jobs four years ago, I mean the, the multi six figure jobs when they posted them, 1% of them included in their postings that people could work at home maybe one day every other week. Now, in that same job posting app, 20 to 25 percent mentioned that you, we can negotiate working from home any days of the week that you would like. How many? We'll discuss it, but we'd still like to have your, your CV, you know, which is a really paradigm shift that all of a sudden now the work from home is really, it's, it's included in your um, uh, entire, in, 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 entire job posting. So um, I think that's a real, 
real change of what's happening in, in our in our all over the world, but particularly in our country. I um, it, I find it fascinating because it's really having the business person absent at work has really changed a lot of the dynamics, and I'll go into that later on. Um, overall, the year ahead is likely to build on the recovery that is already underway in the macro economy and in commercial real estate. Um, REITs are likely to perform well in this uh, overall environment. The REIT returns during the pandemic. REIT sectors that support digital economy, data centers, infrastructure, industrial REITs rebounded most rapidly in the summer of 2020 as online communications and e-commerce purchased um, uh, took place, uh, replaced in-person interactions during the period of most stringent social distancing and requirements. Other sectors recovered more fully after the vaccines were introduced in November of 2020. And again, I gave you all the numbers that self-storage did the best. Um, the um, fundamentals now are, are seem to be sound from in the macroeconomic outlook. Growth is likely to continue at above average pace. Job growth averaging 550,000 people per month in 2021 reducing the employment rate to around 4%. The total payroll employment is still 7 million below the pre-pandemic trend. That's 7 million below. And this is creating inflate, wage inflation. It's creating, um, it, it's creating a lot of uh, uh, things that we would not have run into. The job market has considerable running room ahead. All sectors of the U.S. economy are in a stronger financial position than they were at a similar point in the past three sessions. Household net worth, this is an incredible, has a record high of $1.42 trillion as of mid-2021. Um, up from 21% from 2019 due to rising stock prices and housing prices, Debt level service represents 13.8% of disposable income compared to 17% in 08 and 09. So the individual is healthy. Again, a lot of that depends on the equity in their home. You know, that I don't think that's a, I mean, when I look at my net worth, I like to look at my liquid net worth, not what. You know, I, I can't even tell you how many of my friends said, oh, I bought my house for $100,000 10 years ago, and I can now sell it for $300,000. Well, you can't sell anything until you sell it. You know, I mean, it's, <laughs> there's no need to speculate. I mean, you can sort of think about it, but to bank that money or think that that's money in the bank is, I think it's, I think it's misleading, but I've been more conservative after I sat next to an options trader for a year on one of my trading desks, I lost everything I had. I mean, all of my, everything, I, I didn't have a lot back then. It was in the mid 80s. But I was buying and selling puts and calls. And they were really good ideas, but it seemed like the puts or the calls would go out and then the stock price that I wanted would happen a week after the calls and the puts expired, so I lost all my money. And, and I never opened st my statements. That was mature. So I never opened my statements during that period, knowing how much money I was losing, until the day I called down to the cashier and I said, look, I said, my husband and I are going on a vacation and I need a check for $2,000 for spending money. And she said, Lynn, I was just going to call you, but she said, you have a margin call today because you have not only no money in the cash in the account, but in order to keep all your stocks and bonds without selling them, you have to belly up with some money. That was an unpleasant conversation. <laughs> but guess what? I learned from that. I never did that again. I moved my chair on the trading desk. That's how much willpower I had to be away from the options <laughs> later. <laughs> and I didn't buy it. I haven't bought an option since the 80s. So there you go. That was it's my end. Yeah, pardon. <laughs> yeah, you're, I know, you're an option trader, so. Nonsense. A 
while back. Yeah, well, anyway, <laughs> I, I had to learn my lesson the hard way, and God, it was tough. I waited till my husband and I got on our vacation, and we were, we were, we were both dive masters, and we were on a Caribbean island. We were getting, you know, we'd just come up from a nice dive. We were going to have a glass of wine. And uh, I said, "Hun, you know, <laughs> tell me about our, our uh, stock account. <laughs> so anyway, uh, fortunately, he was forgiving, and I think I approached it actually the right moment. So here you go. That was a, that was a hard learn. Um, Anyway, moving along, um, there's three obstacles that are challenging the outlook for our near-term recovery. Ongoing high levels of COVID, production and supply chain bottlenecks, and an elevated inflation rate. Again, I, I'm repeating what economists say. I'm not thinking how elevated this inflation rate is. However, if you micro break down a lot of costs of things. I mean, look at how much you go to the grocery store and your beef and your produce and everything is a lot more than it was maybe a month or two ago or three months ago. I mean, you know, if you really break it down, it probably, it is costing people more. Um, employees are returning to the office. Business travel and many forms of entertainment is happening. The supply chain issues are well known and have restricted auto production, and the availability of many types of goods. Finally, the CPI has risen 6.2% in the past 12 months. Highest, higher interest rates are in the forecast to slow the economy from overheating. Labor shortages, particularly in other hotels and restaurants, have limited businesses from reopening fully. So those are basically the macro things that we have to, that we have to get through. These, these obstacles could ease a reduction in the pandemic. New investments in ports and transportation networks will help ease the bottleneck. But um, I spent the last week in Galveston. Uh, I have a condo on the beach in Galveston, and it was, it was quite lovely. You know, there was, I, like, I like to be there in the winter. It's quiet. And in front of my condo is the Gulf of Mexico. And in the Gulf of Mexico, I can see ships lined up to go all the way into Houston to get into the Houston Ship Channel, a, a phenomenon that I have not seen ever in the history of my gone. You know, they're waiting because they don't have people in the port to unload. So they're parked out there. You know, the people are just not coming back to work. And, and there's probably many, many reasons, you know, a lot of the... Uh, conservative uh, people will point out to the fact that they're getting handouts from the government, they don't have to go back to work. You know, I I have to argue that theory. I'm, I don't lean that side, but, uh, you know, I mean, if that's what they think, that's what they think, I'd want to say that. But in my opinion, I think that during this time, truly, people have realized how much better a quality of life is rather than having two jobs, never getting to see your family, having your wife work three jobs. You know, it just, we need to close the gap between the rich and the poor. I mean, we're losing, losing our middle class, and we need to pay higher wages to the folks that service us, the people that unload our goods, the people that deliver our goods. I mean, where would we be without them? You know, if I can't find something in the grocery store, I go home right away, order it on Amazon, and it's there the next day. You know, so um, Amazon will, in fact, take over the world some days, we know. And, uh, you know, the interesting thing, I heard a commentary about, about uh, um, Amazon, uh, and this man was an advocate for small companies and small, small businesses, and he said, Amazon is taking away all the small businesses in the world. And, and he said, in the next five or six years, you'll be paying $600 a year for your Prime membership. And I saw in the newspaper the other day that Amazon is now raising its Prime membership to 180 a year to be Amazon Prime. And who won't pay it? I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, really, you know, that's, we fallen in love with Amazon. I mean, if nothing else, the movies, you know, that you get to see on your Amazon Prime account. 
Um, the Jack Reacher movie is going to be out this week, ladies. Be sure and be, be sure with uh, take a look, take a look at that one. That's going to be a good one. So, at any rate, not the series, but the movie. The movie, yeah, it's the one Tom Cruise was in. Um, that they replaced Tom Cruise with a uh, um, an updated model of Tom Cruise, and it, it looks. It looks <laughs> have, you seen, have you seen the ads for that? Has anybody seen the ads for that? Yeah. I, I have. I thought it was the show, though. Is it a movie? Yeah, I think it's a movie. Oh, yeah, okay. I know it's on Amazon Prime. Okay. <laughs> anyway, enough of that. I've regressed. So um, anyway, um, I'm. I'm going to outline the commercial real estate temporary versus structural changes. Retail. Uh, the rise of e-commerce has been changing the way consumers shop long before the pandemic began. Online sales surged even higher in the early months of the pandemic as shopping centers and malls shut down due to social distancing. Sales through brick and mortar channels fell $57 billion in the second quarter of 2020. 57 billion in the stores, while e-commerce sales rose to a record 41 billion. However, brick and mortar, when I say brick and mortar, it's strip centers, malls, sales came back as stores reopened. $82 billion gain in the third quarter. However, the surprise is e-commerce sales didn't fall with the rebound, but it continued to build. So this tells us that the consumer is spending that $1.42 trillion of additional assets that they have. As we do, we're Americans, we spend. So uh, anyway, that's, that seems that's interesting, though, that, that uh, um, Amazon is, is not losing uh, uh, customers. In store shopping for certain items, clothes, shoes, groceries, e-commerce will continue Industrial logistics, data center, infrastructure, communications, towers, they'll, they'll still continue to do well. Um, the cyclical look is that we'll have a temporary decline in brick and mortar re retail, but permanent or structural ongoing role for in-store purchases for many items together with online purchases of others. So I think we will see a balance, but I think both of these will be viable you know, going to um, West U and shopping in, in, in the strip center there is just as easy sometimes as ordering online. You might not be able to get what you want online. To come, upside potential in retail as new tenants sign leases to fill vacant spaces. Um, residential. All types of residential housing are experiencing a record surge in demand amidst a uh, amidst limited supply. Multi-family vacancy rates are at record lows, driving rent growth, double-digit increases. Housing markets are experiencing surging prices for home purchases and large increases in rents for single-family rentals. Manufactured housing is also experiencing strong demand. That means a trailer when they say manufacturing homes that a lot of people um, it's not just an RV, but it's it's a trailer where they they'll permanently anchor in a in a uh, manufactured home community. Our manufactured home communities, I don't think, are pretty in Texas. I mean, we don't really have. But I've been in parts of the country, particularly in the West, where they're really beautiful. It would really be fun to have a trailer in these gorgeous places that have a lake in them and you know nice amenities and um, beautiful trees and campground facilities, you know, I mean, when you think of manufactured housing and trailer parks, it's not a pretty picture in Texas, but again, you know, throughout the rest of the, I've been seeing some of them throughout the rest of the country, and, and they're not as horrific as, as what we might think, so uh, uh, anyway, there is a, there, there, there is a, uh, a golden factor to, to do something like that. Uh, two factors are responsible for these tight conditions. Um, supply shortage even before the pandemic started. Um, to, between 2008, which is the big financial crisis, and 2013, um, it was difficult to get mortgage rates, uh, uh, mortgage loans, because the banks were in trouble and it, you know, and all the mortgage companies went out of business. It was it was a pretty bleak time during that time. Um, that caused a backup for home buyers. 
And right now, in February 2022, there's 3.8 million units short of meeting the nation's needs. 3.8 million units. So you look around Houston, you say, God, we're really overbuilding all these apartments. Maybe not. I mean, I always think maybe we are overbuilding, but it, it seems like obviously there's, there is need for those. Um, and, and a lot of things have happened. Millennials are now into the housing market, uh, and they've been half of all the mortgage originations last year. I, I guess they have decided they didn't want to live in the Airstream and try to bring up babies, so they're now buying, buying homes. Um, investors who are now uh, snatching up one in six homes, I, I bet it's more than that. You know, my condo I was telling you about in Galveston, it has 100 units in it. And 95% are owned by people that use it as an Airbnb. 95% of that condo, uh, up from maybe five years ago to 15%. It's an Airbnb. People bought them, you know, bought them, and they're just, it, that's what they do. This is an interesting figure. 63% of North American home buyers in 2020 made at least one offer on a home before they stepped into it. 63% bought, were looking to buy houses online. I mean, I find that exceedingly high number, but now that doesn't mean that 63% consummated their sales online, but they made an offer. So I, so I guess that's what's happening now. I mean, my niece, um, She's 32. She and her husband bought two of their homes online without seeing them. Yes? You said this was in 2020? Yes. And do you think that them like uh, making offers on homes without uh, stepping into the actual home itself is like a product of the, their motivations for buying homes are changing? Or do you think it's like a combination of also with the pandemic? I think it's probably both. I think you're right on that. I think maybe the motivations, you know, I'll get into it a little later, but um, when you look at the most popular zip codes for purchasing in our country, it's not Houston, Dallas, Austin, because it's just too expensive. The most popular zip code for purchasing in our country is Colorado Springs then Franklin, Tennessee, then Winchester, Massachusetts, outside of Boston. I mean, people say they're moving to Dallas. They're not moving to Dallas. They're moving to Lucas and Anna. Heavens knows where they are. They're, you know, that's like saying, you know, Fulcher here near Houston is one of the most popular zip codes now in the country. For people. people say, well, I'm moving to Houston, but they're not. They're moving to Fulcher. Where I I'm not I, I grew up here, but I'm not really sure. Do you know where Fulcher is? Southwest. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, Southwest. <laughs> <laughs> so we actually have a lot of land. We can have land. You know, and these are homes that are 300, 400 thousand and have 2,500, 3,500 square feet. You know, I mean, but these zip codes where people are um, um, purchasing homes. I was I was going to read that, but. Um, uh, Peabody, Massachusetts, Manchester, New Hampshire, Brentwood, North Carolina, that's near Raleigh, Durham. Uh, you know, they can't buy homes in the big cities. And they, their work from home environment, they might work in Raleigh, Durham, but they only have to go in three days a week or maybe two days a week. So why not get a 2,500, 3,000 square foot home for $350,000, $400,000 in one of these communities? Um, Franklin, Tennessee, as I mentioned, that's near Nashville. Nashville's gotten outrageously expensive. Um, Wyndham, Maine. So, I mean, these are places where people could get land. They can get $300,000, $400,000 homes. Um, I mean, I, I don't think you could buy anything inside the city limits for $300,000, $400,000 in, in, near Houston. So, anyway, that's... I, yeah, I hope that answered your question, but I, yeah, it, it is an interesting time. And plus, a lot of those people, I know like in my building, I think uh, I was talking to the, the manager, and she said that the last three apartments that sold in my building in Galveston 
were um, purchased online. So, you know, I mean, they didn't even look at them, and they're leasing them to Airbnb people. So right now, it doesn't seem like there's any end in sight to our tight conditions in housing and apartment markets, as the supply shortfall is estimated to be in the millions of housing units. And then we have shortages of labor, materials, available land and zoning, although not in Texas, we don't have zoning, so that's cool. We can build the whole state up. <laughs> um, this will keep the new supply from filling the gap for at least several years. Cyclical versus structural factors. The surge in house prices and rents will likely sl slow a little bit, but we still have supply shortfalls. However, tight markets for both home and apartments, I think, will persist far into the future. What to watch? Affordability problems worsening, leading to financial strains and also limiting future rent and price increases. Um, lodging and resorts. Um, this, is, this is interesting because we're now looking at lodging and resorts two different ways. Um, the leisure lodging has benefited greatly in our country. I mean, you go to these wonderful places in California that are in the wine district and they're, they're um, full. They're full for months. International travel, though, has impacted reducing the flow of foreign tourists, so it's basically affecting the big cities. I mean, the big cities like New York, San Francisco, LA, Houston. I mean, you can get a, a, a hotel room in, down, in any of these downtown major metropolitan areas for probably 50% of what you would have paid pre-pandemic. And they offer packages for you want to stay for the weekend, you want to do, uh, you know, staycation and go into downtown Houston and rent a room, um, downtown Dallas. And it's really been impacting um, the, it's, it, it's really been impacting these rates. Business travel uh, should have a cyclical rebound as the pandemic eases. Some business travel and convention, and that's another thing that, that, that is gone. I mean, the online convention, the conventions used to just be um, a huge gold mine for these hotels, absolutely huge. Um, and they're just, they're not here. They, you know, um, I, I attended, I like to I attend Sundance, which is a film festival in the Park City, Utah that Robert Redford started. And they were going to have it in person this year. But at the last minute, because of the Omicron, they switched it to virtual. So that city lost a fortune, you know, park cities, by people not coming and spending money. And hotel prices are jacked up at that time. Restaurants are packed. And there's nobody there because everybody was watching it online. So, you know, I think there, it might be a long-term um, structural result that the recovery, the recovery is, is not complete. So, you know, this will bring me to, uh, well, I'll, I'll talk about the business traveler when I get into office. Let's go into self-storage. It's had a banner year, as we mentioned. Strong housing markets and greater mobility in an era where some employees continue to work from anywhere, all fuel demand for storage. There may be some downside risk of a reduction in employees who are working from home decreases the need to clear out spare rooms in homes and apartments. Self-storage is riding a longer-term wave that is likely to remain robust due to the strength in housing markets. So, you know, a lot of people might sell their house and their new house isn't ready. So, you know, they'll get a self-storage unit for 90 days, 60 days, or whatever. So that's a big trend in self-storage that's good for it. Um, Health care began a cyclical recovery in 2021. Occupancy moved higher in senior housing, both assisted living and independent living, and in skilled nursing. Longer-term structural issues include costs of protecting against inflation in residential settings. These are for like your skilled nursing, your uh, nursing homes where people, you know, there was a lot of deaths in these homes because of COVID. It was quite sad. So people stopped going into these homes and, and stayed at home. And, and the, uh, the nursing home reads did, uh, did 
not well, but it seems like they have people coming back. Their big issue now is trying to find workers. I mean, it's very difficult. Um, I heard on 60, I watched 60 Minutes Sunday night, and they were interviewing three um, people uh, that own big health care facilities, and each one of them said that they could they could hire between 50 and 100,000 nurses. That that's that's what big shortages they've had. So that's a that's a real staggering statistic. Now they own these huge health facilities all over the country. Um, so I want to mention uh, office. Now this is I think this is tricky. Um, Office employees are returning, but um, <coughs> they haven't shown, the office sector hasn't shown an incredible amount of weakness. It is off of 8%, because a lot of these major companies have what they call long-term leases. So when Bank of America goes into rent, rent space five years ago before COVID, they signed a 10-year lease. They got a lot of extras. They had many kitchens built out. You know, they negotiated the lease. They probably had to pay for a lot of their their new their new uh, facilities to uh, retrofit their offices like they wanted. And so these have not been impacted yet. But what it is impacting, if Bank America has ten floors in a building. And now with the work from home, office at home, and um, more flexible work hours, they're going to cut down on their density. So the 10 floors that they've leased, they really only need six. So they have four floors that has another five years on that lease. So what they do is they sublease that space, and they're in direct competition to the building owner. So the building owner is trying to lease two floors, and here's Bank America leasing, subleasing their floors, and um, for a less amount than the um, building owner. So the building owner now all of a sudden has to step up and say, "Hey, look, you know, I'll put in three new kitchens. Do you want a workout room? Do you, you know?" And this is a lot of of uh, money that they have to put into the new space, which will certainly cut into their profit to be able to get tenants to come into the building. So it's a whole do, new dynamic in work in in um, leasing offices in major cities. Um, in May of 2020, 46 million employees reported that they were working from home due to the pandemic. In 18 months, millions of workers returned to the office, interrupted, of course, by the surge in cases uh, in November and December of 2020. The trends are showing that office workers are coming back, but the pace at which they will return still depends on the pandemic. Major companies confirm that offices are an essential part of the business model as evidenced by new lease renters. When workers return, significant decline in the square footage per worker and less density in the office because of the work from, from home. Um, it's, uh, you know, I just find this sector very, it's, I think it's a long shot as to whether it's going to do well. Um, I mean, I've talked to a lot of businessmen that do have offices. I had lunch with one when I was in New York in January, and he said, I'm never going to go to Detroit again to see my clients in Detroit. He said, you know, I used to fly up there in the morning, have lunch with them, uh, have dinner with another client, spend the night there, and come back the next day. And he said, we, I've known these folks for 10, 15 years, and I'm just going to use Zoom. Everybody's happier with Zoom. We don't really need to get in person anymore. So, you know, it's this kind of thing that we're very comfortable with soon. Uh, I myself belong to things like the Dallas uh, um, World Affairs Council. I, I, I go to SMU lecture series. And I'm really happy 
to see it on Zoom now. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry that I have to get up, get dressed, put on my makeup, head out, and put my contacts in, heaven forbid, and drive five minutes. <laughs> I mean, it's not like it's a big trip for me. And sit there and listen to a lecture. I'd rather just sit at home in my pajamas and fuzzy slippers and watch it on Zoom <laughs> with no video on. <laughs> so anyway, it's... I don't, you know, there's just a lot of people, particularly, you know, you have the business traveler, traveler that's, um, you know, I mean, he's bringing a lot of money to our society and to our offices and to our downtowns. And people don't realize what a, a phenomenal loss that is to not have him come back. I mean, New York, the average hotel room during the week is probably the, the rent. Pre-pandemic for a room was probably six fifty to seven hundred. It's ridiculous. You know, we drop a little bit on weekend rates, and you could find bargain hotels on the outskirts of, of the business area. Your average lunch in Manhattan is probably for a nice restaurant. You know, really nice restaurant, glass of wine. It's probably a hundred dollars a person. Um, you go to the theater to get a decent theater ticket. You're paying a hundred bucks, hundred fifty bucks, or if you get it from a scalper from a hot show, it might even be more. Um, your plane travel, like from Monday, if you're leaving on a Monday and coming back on a Wednesday, you know, your your um, uh, coach airfare probably from Dallas to um, New York is probably $700. You know, you put in the Saturday night stay and it would drop down to, to 500 But, you know, that is a think of all those industries that it's affecting hotels restaurants, theater, air travel, and it's all keyed on is that business traveler going to get his butt dressed and go into work and go into the office and entertain. I mean, and I think the older people in the workforce are resisting it and they don't have to, but I think it's really hurting the younger people that are getting into the workforce because they don't have mentors, they're not making friends. I mean, I actually have friends that I've known forever from uh, my early work days. And you treasure those friends and those mentors and people that you've you've met through the years. And, you know, that's what the younger folks are missing out on. And I think it's the younger folks that will drive people back into the office. That That's what I've heard. That's what I've read. So, um, anyway, um, the, the um, I was on a conference call with... Uh, my um, office team at, at Green Street where I used to work and we, we uh, and they basically said that the work from home, one sixth of all workers now will only work three days in the office. The number of job postings post COVID advertised three and a half days in the office. Um, and I mentioned the high paying jobs which are posted now. It used to be only one to two percent are work from home, and now twenty percent are saying, you know, you can work from home. Um, the big tech, which is probably uh, kind of an office-centric culture, and now two days a week or whatever employee wants, um, you know, and this makes uh, tech um, space office space uh, down fifteen percent. Um, the demand to job growth is is very high right now. Uh, it's 1.7, which which is the highest it's been in 30 years. And um, in the Sun Belt areas, Austin and Atlanta uh, are up three percent. Their office buildings are up three percent with people coming back. In the West Gateway, like Los Angeles and San Francisco, office is down 1.8 percent. In the East Gateway market, it's down 2.1. That's New York and all along the New York, uh, all along the East Coast, New York, Boston. Um, Chicago could be thrown there. I'm sure it's somewhere in between. And the average return to office is 0. 0.3 tenths of a percent. So people are just, they're just not returning. Um, but work from home is not the same in all markets. The best markets are the Sunbelt. Houston, Dallas, Orlando, Raleigh, Durham, Austin, Atlanta, and Seattle. 
Um, the, you know, there's high level nationwide vacancy, construction costs, supply chain disruptions. Leasing will not reach uh, 2019 levels until 2023, and if, if they do. And the interesting thing is all of the newer, greener buildings are doing well. There's a company that's called SL Green, not because they're green, but their founder's name is green. But they're building new buildings in Manhattan now. And it's all of this green, you know, the green buildings. Whereas Vernado, that owns probably 60% of all the commercial real estate in, in New York, um, they have those old buildings that are beautiful with the sculptures and the friezes on the walls. We walk in absolutely gorgeous buildings, but they're not energy efficient. A lot of them don't even have central air. They've got window, you know, they've got uh, wall units. I mean, they're just not energy efficient. And more and more people are very, very much concerned with the, with the E of the ESG. So, I mean, it's a, it's a really, really big deal, which is a good thing, but it's, it's a really big deal in offices. So the big cities, I mean, look at New York, look at San Francisco, look at Boston. I mean, those buildings aren't new. I mean, a new building in uh, Boston would be 15 years old. So, you know, they just don't have that green that everybody wants to see. Um, and here's, this is a great statistic. Um, for many corporations, there's no going back to pre-COVID norms or a traditional five-day in-person work week. 64% of employees with some of America's biggest corporations would turn down a $30,000 pay increase in order to keep working from home indefinitely. $30,000 instead of to work from home. That's, I think that's a big number. Hybrid work are, are depressing rents down 10 to 20 percent. Vacancies are up. Commute times and cost of living are also a variable, which can be affected. And um, New York, San Francisco, Chicago, DC, Boston, LA, leasing demands are depressed. They're all down 25 percent. This sector has been hit very hard. But here's another thing, round trip average commute times by city. New York, 72 minutes, your average round trip commute to get to your job. DC, 69 minutes. Chicago, 63. Atlanta, 63. Boston, 63. Is Houston, Dallas, or Austin better? Not much. Houston's 59, Dallas is 56, and Austin is 53%. You know, they have no infrastructure in Austin. We can say they're, they're probably the most exciting city in our <laughs> in our state, but you can't get around. Yes, sir. Uh, real quick, I was just thinking about your your statement on the thirty thousand dollars, like uh, yeah, like sixty percent or so. When, do you have information on like the average pay of those workers? That that was yeah. Was you know what? I don't. I I picked this statistic off, and it didn't say yeah, like thirty thousand dollars for somebody that's making ninety would be a big increase. That thirty thousand dollars for somebody that's making 250 would not be a big deal. No, I don't. I, okay. I, I, I'll, I'm going to do a deep dive. I, I'm going to look back on that. But uh, uh, it's still not, you know, pocket change. For, <laughs> right. So at least we pay somebody's taxes at 250, maybe. Um, anyway, cities like uh, Durham, 47 minutes, Oklahoma City, 45 minutes, and Madison, Wisconsin is uh, 43 minutes. So, um, let's see, Sorry. all right, um, another, you know, an economic issue that's kind of uh, uh, going around is that um, there's a lot more private market transactions because a lot of these companies are flush with cash. And storage, you know, self-storage is really only probably 40% owned by public people, public companies. A lot of mom and pops own self-storage. Um, and, and the private transactions and storage is up 66%, industrials up 53%, apartments up 22%, strips up 13%, mall up 1%. 
lodging is down 1% and office is down 4%. Um, the gateway markets versus Sunbelt, when I say gateway, I mean East Coast and West Coast. Um, uh, uh, there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of differences in terms of the class A assets um, versus the class B. Atlanta uh, is um, a better gateway city. It's up 6.1 percent, and DFW, Charlotte, Seattle, Boston, and Phoenix are up 2.8 percent. So it's a big hit to the office landlords, um, environmental standards, which I mentioned. Capital expenses, expenditures going forward for a lot of these office owners, which I, you know, I mentioned when I said that you have to really appease tenants to get into these old buildings. Our capital expenditures are up maybe 2.4 percent. Office REITs in general are currently trading at 20 percent below their net asset value, and their five-year history is they they usually trade down maybe one percent of their NF. Um, their net asset value. Um, right now, uh, the 10-year growth in the public markets could return. Um, you know, the economists are saying that self-storage will continue to be up 5.9%, mall up 5.7%, apartment up 5.7%, lodging up 5.6%, industrial up 5.6%, strip up 55 an office down 5.1. So everything looks like they're going to be up between 5.5 and 6%, except office. We're looking at a 10 year growth in the public market if you bought these stocks. So um, anyway, um, oh, I just want to throw by one statistic. This is pathetic. The hotel business travel revenue by state, uh, but I'm just going to quote the nationwide figure. The nationwide figure, the total hotel business had revenue of $89 billion in 2019. In 2021, it was $30 billion, the difference being $60 billion, with a percentage of down 66%. So the hotel, uh, and as you can imagine, the worst exposed cities um, were, the worst exposed states were um, New Jersey was down 78%, um, New York, New York was down 82%, um, Texas was down 60%, Washington, uh, D.C. was down 73%. Um, so you have uh, Illinois, which is Chicago, was down 8%. So, you know, these hotel revenues, you know, it's, it's going to take a long time back. Um, which I just want to mention that I, 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 I have been traveling during the pandemic. I've been careful as one can be keep a mask on all the time, do the hand thing, social distance as much as I can, and um, uh, carry a pile of wipes to wipe my rooms and everything. I, so anyway, I, I've, I've lucked out. But it's fascinating because I, I mentioned in my last class I, um, uh, a comment that economists are using called skimflation. And skimflation means that I, I'm paying $40, $50 a night for a room in New York, which is not cheap, uh, but not outrageous. And, uh, but it's what you have to pay if you want to get in certain neighborhoods and, and have uh, running water. So anyway, um, in the hotel, there is, there's no turn down service at night. You know, they come in and turn down your room and and put a stale mint on your, you can't get your sheets changed unless you ask. You have to ask to get your sheets changed and towels. You have to get asked to get new sheets and towels because of COVID. And the mini bar has all of these sensors on it now 
where it has Cokes and Dr. Peppers and whatever in the mini bar beers. And if you even move something from the mini bar to put your bottle of water in there to chill it while you're out, the sensor will charge you immediately $8 for that bottle of Dr. Pepper. <laughs> and it's just insulting because one of the hotels that I stayed in had a big note on it and it said, if you move any of these products, the sensor will go off and if you, you are going to be charged a $50 fine to store your water. And it's just, you know, they've taken everything away from, oh, this place I used to stay while well, I like to stay there is they had a free breakfast. No more because of COVID. No more free breakfast. There wasn't even a doorman there when I checked in. I had to haul my luggage up um, three steps uh, up. You know, not that that was a big deal, but... You know, it used to be kind of nice to have a doorman when you get out of your taxi to have it pick up your luggage and take it in for you, but, but they weren't there anymore. So, do you think we as consumers are going to be so happy that we can get out and travel and have a fun time and stay in hotels? Are we going to miss any of these little niceties that we used to enjoy? Um, I don't know. I actually find that the cheaper hotels, in my opinion, like Marriott Courtyard and Hampton Inn and Suites, that you know, I, I did a cross country trip from uh, um, Dallas up to um, North Carolina and hit Florida on the way back on the southern route. And I stayed in these Marriott Courtyards and the Hampton Inns. They actually had breakfast buffets in the morning for free, and they actually had big refrigerators in the room where you could put all of your stuff that you were eating in your car to keep it cool. And they actually had a note and said, we don't change the sheets every day, but if you want to have the sheets changed during your stay, please put this note on your bed. And they actually came in and made your bed during the day. Whereas at this big hotel, they wouldn't come in and even make your bed unless you ask at the desk. So, I don't know. I, oh, and they have free Wi-Fi. Whereas at the big hotel, I had to pay $35 a day for, for Wi-Fi for the 450. So it's these prices are going to, are going up because the hotels need revenue, and all of your amenities are going to go away. Uh, so um, that's kind of what 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 I'm seeing in terms of going forward to travel. So John, I'm out of time. I mean, I'm out of um, talking. I don't think I'm out of time, am I? I think we have time for questions. If, if anybody want. has questions, although we did a lot during my chat. Does anybody have a question about anything I've chatted about? Yes. I know I've asked quite a few questions. No, that, I'm today, happy to hear the questions. That means you paid attention. <laughs> well, I was just curious, uh, on the sheet with, with the hotel industry returns, which state fared the best? Just out of curiosity. There was nobody up. Because uh, in my head, I would imagine it's states with relatively low. Low business, yeah. yeah. Okay. Alabama was only down 37%. I know we're all dying to go to Alabama. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh. oh, this isn't. Montana was only down 27%. And that makes sense. I mean, you know, the national parks, yeah. I, I spent um, the month of June in, um, in Montana, in Jackson Hole. Actually, it was Wyoming then. Jeez. In Jackson Hole, Wyoming, I rented a place there and hiked in Yellowstone. And poor park rangers. Oh, my God. People were in conga lines to get in, and you had to make reservations to get into the park, or they wouldn't let you in. Did anybody go to a national park last summer? Well, you saved yourself a lot of anguish, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> so anyway, um, Montana was only down 27%. I'm looking at the people that 
South Dakota was only down 35%. And that's it. Actually, uh, Wyoming, this is interesting, uh, which I said I was in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, was down 80%. So, you know, I, you know what, I bet that's a lot of, um, a lot of convention stuff, because Wyoming, everybody wants to go to Wyoming for conventions. And I visited, uh, while I was there, I visited two of the top resorts that were there in Wyoming, where they do have a lot of their Rocky Mountains, and they have gorgeous views, it was lovely. And they, all of their restaurants were closed on both of these properties. Um, one of them had limited service for their hotel guests, but you know, for people visiting from the outside, it was closed. Um, so, uh, yeah, but um, actually, but you know, other than needing a reservation to get in, you know, it was kind of nice to travel during this time. So, yeah. Anyway. Well, then, thank you for yes. educating us what's going on out there. We <laughs> And again, if anybody has any more questions, I think we still have a little bit of time. If you'd like anybody? Okay. All right. Well, keep traveling. Keep spending money the American way. Get out there and spend that extra 1.42 trillion we have. <laughs> <laughs>